topics today that we kind of want to uh, hear about is just generally um, a, a path in maybe in contrast to the other talks we've heard, uh, general generally a path of in academics um, for for women uh, who are interested in quantum or want to do uh, quantum research. And of course, this doesn't just include quantum computing, but also includes. Um, uh, in general, quantum mechanics, condensed matter physics, which of course has a, a big component of quantum. But these days, universities um, are all really kind of getting into the business of quantum. There's a lot of spin offs, there's a lot of collaboration with industry. And um, that's why I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the academic side of it. So, why, uh, why me? I'm very deeply enmeshed in the academic side of it. I'm an assistant professor at the Center for Quantum Devices. Uh, I'm at the Niels Bohr Institute uh, in Denmark. It's in the University of uh, Copenhagen. It's really nice to be able to speak to um, uh, an, an, like a, a conference like this. Uh, I usually speak at very academic conferences. So um, let me know if... Uh, if it gets quite technical. Um, is there still a lot of noise or is it okay? There's actually no noise on my side, so it's a bit uh, weird. Great, okay. Um, so my talk is kind of divided into uh, two um, uh, topics. So one is kind of my path into academia or how I like to call it, um, how I got dragged into this uh, kind of Ponzi scheme. Uh, and then the second part, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about um, my uh, my topic for today, which actually is kind of totally opposite to what uh, the Zapata keynote talk uh, was about. So they were talking about um, quantum machine learning. So as I kind of see it, quantum assisted machine learning. Whereas what I'm gonna talk about is more about how can machine learning assist us to build a quantum computer. And I'm very strongly on the hardware side. So I build the quantum hardware that, um, uh, so so as you can see, it's really like a give and take between the, the software and the hardware and between AI and um, quantum. So um, why do I call academia a Ponzi scheme? So PhD Comics had a great uh, comic about this, where which, they, which uh, he called the beware the prophecy scheme. So the way it works is basically, you know, faculty convinces young scholars to work in their field, telling you things about how science is amazing. It's kind of true. It is amazing. Uh, and then, you know, each scholar recruits more scholars and then the funding runs out and then there's a there's a big uh, collapse. Um, but I mean, I'm kind of joking because, of course, I really love my job. Um, I uh, from a very young age. So I was. Um, I grew up in um, in India, so I put a red dot to show uh, exactly where in India I grew up. And uh, from whenever I was a kid, um, people would always tell me that I really looked like, a, I don't know, like someone that was in science and uh, someone who was a physicist. And I think uh, I, it must be those like huge glasses because uh, I mean, I, I really went in and dug out this this picture for you guys. Um, but uh, really, at that point, I was not so interested in science. I actually wanted to be uh, an author. But then um, I uh, was always kind of interested in um, uh, in physics when I kind of discovered the, the Feynman lectures, which actually my dad um, gave to me. So I think throughout this talk, I'm just going to try to talk a little bit about um we all know it's really hard to get women into esteem EM academia. And uh, I'm just going to talk about what I think smoothed my path into, um, into this field. And of course, one of them is that um, my parents were always very encouraging about science. And as I, as I said, my dad got me the, um, uh, the Feynman lectures. And I think this is extremely important for, uh, you know, people that have kids, right? You really have to, they're like sponges. Uh, so you really have to watch um, how you talk about science to girls and boys. And I think that's something that my dad did for me. So he's an engineer and um, 
that's why he always exposed me to and now i build you know lego out of out of quantum dots so um after that i moved to the us so i went to um uh, princeton university and here you can see the very uh famous uh, it's it's a, actually the the princeton tiger is the mascot and this is a orange and um black are the colors so really they always make this giant tiger that's kind of uh, holds a lot of beer uh, for reunions um so uh what i really enjoyed about my time there and what i think is the second thing i would say um is important for women in stm is that um a lot of us tend to self select out of the field and some of this is because um uh you kind of have been told your whole life that this is very hard and that women can't do this but so something about princeton was that um they kind of made you do a senior thesis and they kind of made you do uh research with um faculty members and this is something that i think cannot really um be oversold like you have to uh force people uh to do you can't really give them a choice where you say some people can do uh theses and some people cannot do theses some people can do research some people cannot because um a lot of people they might be really really great researchers but they just lack that confidence to say that yes i would be an asset to the lab and i would be yes i'm going to be the person that discovers the next uh, big thing right so the moment you get them in that lab um they're going to work really hard but they just don't know that it's something that they could do really well um so that's why um i would say that i was able to do 3 years of research in a lab uh at princeton and this really helped me out um and what you see here on the slide is kind of the the kind of uh um what princeton writes about their senior thesis that um integral to the process is the opportunity to work one on one with the with a faculty member and this really i think um makes a difference um so after after princeton i uh, kind of again uh made quite a big jump where i moved to um london um so i uh, was supposed to go to oxford but then our whole lab moved to university college london which is really nice because i got to actually see um you know the the city itself and have a have a great time actually not living in a tiny one horse town so that was that was super great and this is also something i would like to highlight that um that i think is important uh, as women that we that we put ourselves first sometimes right like if if um doing science is your passion and to do science you have to you know in a in a in the start, in your 20s you have to move a lot then do that you know people around you will adjust you cannot say um you know uh what what, what are my parents going to do what are my it's true that a lot of people have obligations that they cannot um uh let go of and of course that those are very important and workplaces have to be flexible in order to accept those but on the other hand it's also very important that you um are able to tell yourself and this is something people kind of maybe tell women not to do you can tell yourself you know i want to move i'm going to move and um uh everything else i'm just going to uh have that fall into place uh um and then so of course now i moved to again uh, after my phd to uh copenhagen that's where i am now so this is this view of the city is really the strictly like we only have two days of summer view so it does not look like that um i know at this moment there's sunlight on my face but that's just they're trying to uh, they're trying to trick you uh and i moved to the niels bohr institute which uh i mean i guess all of us in the field kind of know that um the niels bohr in copenhagen and these uh, places around you know 19 the early 1900s were kind of the birthplace of quantum and um uh this is kind of why i'm i'm really i feel really honored to be here um and uh, to work with a lot of great people of course i don't spend my time outside i spend most of my time uh, in the lab um doing strange uh uh strange things with liquid nitrogen and I, here i would just like to flag that we are very much hiring phd's and postdocs so 
um, you're, feel free to contact me if you're interested. Um, and as I said before, um, all these universities, a, a lot of them now are rising up to the fact that there is a lot of interest in quantum from industry. And um, um, uh, I have, uh, I see a question about remote uh, PhDs and postdocs. Yeah, so remote is a bit difficult, but uh, but let's have a talk about it. Um, and somebody also asked that uh, it depends on your point in life. Exactly. I mean, that's I totally agree with you. And that's why I said that it totally matters about people depending on you. But, you know, all I'm saying is that give yourself the same leeway that a, a guy in your position would give you. I think that's uh, that that's the main point of what I was uh, trying to say there. Right. So um, at at um, at our um uh, university, we also have a, a spin-off called Q Double, which is very different from a lot of these software companies. Um, and uh, what we do is kind of essentially build um, electronics that uh, help you control quantum hardware. And this is also super difficult, right? Because you're talking about millikelvin temperatures and um, uh, you know lots and lots of wiring, so you don't get your quantum devices too hot to operate. So that's something that I'm also very interested in. And um, Denmark is really interesting. I mean, I recently got uh, featured in the newspaper. I couldn't read any of it, of course. Uh, so uh, it that was kind of nice. Uh, I'm trying to learn Danish, but it's I've made more guttural sounds than I have ever made in my life. But um, uh, it's not all perfect, of course. This is a picture I took from, uh, I think, one of our uh, gender... Um, balance seminars where uh, if you look at this kind of pipeline, then there's almost like equal amounts of uh, uh, women and uh, men taking uh, master's degrees. But somehow um, right after the master's degree, this just kind of starts falling off. And by the time you get to the full professor level, uh, there's already a, a huge gap. Um, and this kind of brings me to the last uh, point that I wanted to mention uh, in, with regards to my journey, um, that uh, what is really, really important and what can really make or break your career is to find a good mentor and a good lab environment because um, the structures of power in some ways are still somewhat um, against you. So um, you have to, I mean, not to, of course, not to, you know, scare anyone because, uh, you know, there are a lot of women now that are really overturning these stereotypes and becoming professors and becoming having great careers in academia. But what I am saying is that uh, when you are looking for a PhD, when you are looking for a postdoc, um, you should always uh, not assess not just the lab as a lab, but also the mentor as a mentor, because it is really very important for your career that, um, you have you have a good mentor and somebody who is um, who really um, is going to help you further your career and um, and uh, also um, something that I think is slightly controversial uh, is that what I will say is that uh, the fact about authorship and collaborations um, as women we are taught to be a little uh, maybe diffident uh, societally. And I would say, uh, <laughs> thanks, Maria. Uh, I think you should always, um, as as a woman, you should always be proactive in looking for collaborations and in uh, and always clarifying your role on a paper and uh, saying that you know, yes, I deserve um, authorship and I deserve uh, to be on this paper and I deserve to be on this project. And this is something that potentially you will have to do a lot. And that sucks, but um, that's also um, uh, hopefully something that is slowly changing. And um, I think that is my uh, one of the last, uh, the my last two cents of you know how to uh, uh, kind of make it to the near the top of this prophecy scheme because I'm still I would say um, you know not at the top. But um, I'm gonna move away from that now and just tell you very quickly a little bit about. Um, how I use machine learning uh, in terms of building uh, quantum dot tuning 
and for uh, qubit classification. So the kind of qubit I work on is, of course, you know that zero and one uh, is what makes a digital bit. But what I work on is um, these arrays of um, quantum dots, which is each host electrons. And as you know, electrons have spin. And uh, depending on whether they're an, in an upspin or downspin state with respect to some external magnetic field that you have applied, you can kind of call that a one or a zero. And uh, this is now becoming your qubit. So I won't go too much into uh, these details. I'm going to just say that um, what is a challenge for us is to build something like superconducting qubits uh, ha have already done, is to make addressable qubits that have nearest neighbor connections in these arrays and where you can perform a uh, simultaneous readout of uh, states. Um, so uh, another thing I would like to highlight is that spin qubits are very, very small. So you can fit a lot more of them uh, on a um, on a chip than you can if you have superconducting qubits. Of course, there are downsides to them as well because you have lots of gates that you have to get out of your cryostat using wires. Um, so here I've kind of summarized, you know, some challenges that I work on. So one is how do you design sensors that can read out these, you know, arrays uh, at this kind of um, fast and simultaneously. And lastly, how do we engineer interactions between these elements? Um, and I'm just going to quickly show a picture of the kind of devices I work on. And this is, um, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I can't go too much into it, but we, we can discuss it uh, later at some point. Um, and uh, this, this, this is a two by two system. This is a two by N system. So the dots here represent quantum dots, which can each hold one of these qubits or electrons. And um, over here, you'll see um, four qubits, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and uh, four sensors that read out these qubits. Uh, and there's two things I will talk about. One is uh, automatic classification of these qubits, and one is tuning of these qubits. So the automatic classification uh, is that um, simultaneously, you can read all four of these qubits out, and we showed this in our recent paper. I'm, I've just shown here quickly four uh, traces for all four of these qubits where you can see the oscillation of the qubit from one to zero and back again. Uh, and the thing we're working on with machine learning there is where you send a single wave and it reflects off your qubit. and just by your naked eye, you can kind of see the difference between the red zero state and the one triplet state. And in my mind, I'm not a um, machine learning person. So um, uh, to, in my mind, what this kind of says is that if your eye can distinguish these two, then that's probably something that uh, a neural network or uh, a good uh, machine learning scientist can help you distinguish uh, very quickly. So this is what we are working on with regards to these devices. 